and director of the Municipal Services Project. Um, and this is a really exciting event here uh, to hear about these on the ground struggles. Uh, and there was a comment yesterday about perhaps not enough uh, from the south. And we have uh, three or four presentations today from uh, representatives from uh, Africa and Asia uh, and Latin America. So it'll be uh, nice for us to hear. Um, we have an embarrassment of riches in a very short period of time, so speakers are going to get eight minutes each, uh, and hopefully that will give us some time for Q&A afterwards, uh, but you can absorb all this great information. We're generally going to go in the order of uh, people as they are listed here, um, but we're switching up. We're going to have our comrade from Lagos speak first. He has to run off to something. Um, so I uh, will uh, we'll start with him. We do have a uh, technical issue here. The sound is not coming through the speakers. It's only going through the laptop. So I don't know what that's going to be like. Uh, but we'll just do our, uh, our best here. So I'll just very briefly introduce um, each of the speakers by names and, and they can uh, say a little bit more about the if they want. Um, uh, uh, Akinbori Olufwene is with the uh, Envi Environmental Rights Action Group uh, based in Lagos in Nigeria, and uh, we'll start with you. Lagos! I'm director of the Municipal Services Project, um, and this is a really exciting event here uh, to hear about these on-the-ground struggles. Uh, and there was a comment yesterday about perhaps not enough uh, from the south. And we have uh, three or four presentations today from uh, representatives from uh, Africa and Asia uh, and Latin America. So it'll be uh, nice for us to hear. Um, we have an embarrassment of riches in a very short period of time. So speakers are going to get eight minutes each. Uh, and hopefully that will give us some time for Q&A afterwards. Uh, but you can absorb all this great information. We're generally going to go in the order of uh, people as they are listed here, um, but we're switching up. We're going to have our comrade from Lagos speak first. He has to run off to something, um, so I will uh, we'll start with him. We do have a uh, technical issue here. The sound is not coming through the speakers. It's only going through the laptop, so I don't know what that's going to be like, uh, but we'll just do our, uh, our best here. So I'll just very briefly introduce um, each of the speakers by names, and, and they can uh, say a little bit more about their own if they want. Um, uh, Akinbori Olufwene is with the uh, Envi Environmental Rights Action Group uh, based in Lagos in Nigeria, and uh, we'll start with
And so we found that the best way to do is to organize. And uh, we started organizing our people. Uh, our water right movement you know, was born. I believe that for management to come up, I said the only way to go in managing water facility in Lagos is for them to hand it over to private um, individuals. I see that especially as self indicting Again, there are lots of money in between 1999 and now. There are a lot of money you know, that has gone into water sector. But unfortunately, the, the amount of money that has gone into water sector, we do not see you know, evidence that this money actually used for the purpose um, it, it was meant for at the initial stage. The movement since Street 15 has pushed back efforts by the Lagos State Government in conjunction with the World Bank and global water multinationals like Vala and Abenwa. The evil that will come upon us, because we are all legal citizens, is that one, we are not going to have better water quality. First of all, the investment will not, these, these corporations are not going to put in a dime. Public private partnerships, as we know, uh, uh, is just another word for scam. These investors are not going to bring any money. They will still be the state government that, the local government that will take them to the bank and <laughs> secure loans for them. And if in default, it is still the government that is going to pay. There were rallies, community meetings, petitions, and even consultations of the government. All these activities made the environment toxic for water privatization. But the promoters of water privatization wouldn't back down easily. In 2017, the Lagos State Government introduced the controversial anti-people Lagos environmental law through which they hit the privatization agenda. The law, among others, criminalizes the entire informal water sector. But they are water, a right movement, rose to the occasion. The people won. There are critical points along the road. When we started in 2015, the government went outside Nigeria to oppose that they were going to conclude privatization of PPP uh, within four months. There are we, 2019, none of those contracts are succeeded. We have slowed down the hands of water privatization <coughs> in Lagos and in Nigeria. Well, we will continue to mobilize the people to say water is a right. Uh, we will continue to mobilize negotiations to demand democratic control <coughs> of public water. We have produced a document to show them alternative to what the World Bank and the IFC is proposing to them. We will ensure that we win definitely in Lagos. Our <coughs> water, our right, has pushed back governors and still winning. They are Water Our Right Coalition made resolute on winning since they believe a win in Lagos will resonate across Nigeria and Africa and send a strong signal to water privatizers to keep their hands off water. <coughs> Explain. Um, probably also got some of these from other clients. Is that PPP in Nigeria is synonymous with corruption? We've seen that in the attempt to go PPP in the waste management sector, the state entered into a, an arrangement with a corporation called Vision Scape. In Lagos, we call it Vision Scam. Now, under that contract, they signed. 750 indigenous <coughs> small businesses that were into waste management in Lagos. And they brought these single companies that we knew was not even cleaning the county anywhere um, in the Western world. And they came in and they served the 750 and then they were supposed to come in and begin to revolutionize and do everything, just make, make, make Lagos clean uh, like that. But under the PPP arrangement in Nigeria, all you need is a fancy PowerPoint, your briefcase, and a so-called professional expertise. Then you sell the idea to the government, the government gives you a bond, you go to the Nigerian bank, and you take a loan, that was what Visionscape did, got the loan, 
and then started business. And the state was paying them, under the contract, the state was supposed to pay them close to a billion. They, they took 40 billion naira loan, which was guaranteed by the state government. And if they default, the state pays. And then they took, they were, the state was paying them professional fees, about a billion naira every month. And the state was supposed to pay them professional fees only, not fees charged to the people about 72 billion over like a period of 10, 12 years. I mean, that's, there's nothing like that you can compare to that other than scam and corruption. And so we also participated, participated in mobilizing people to ensure that we chase vicious scam or vicious scheme out of Nigeria. And I, I just want to warn that we just learned that they are now in Kenya trying to model exactly the same thing. And that's why when PPP idea came in the water sector, we said no, no, no. Our people are going to suffer and then there won't be water, there won't be access because Vision State was even not able to clear the garbage off the street. The whole city was covered with you know, garbage. And yet the state and the citizen will continue to be in debt. That's the story. And what we did was partnership with labor. It's a civil society, labor, grassroots-led people's movement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you have a video as well? Yeah. Yeah, okay, we'll just fire that up. Uh, next speaker um, from South Korea, uh, Sam Lin, uh, Korean Public Service and uh, Transportation Workers Union. And we'll just get her... Uh, do you want to say some introductory remarks about the video before? Yeah, I'm, I'm, the video is ready, and it, it, this was. Uh, I'll let you watch the video. <laughs> and I'll just say that this video was made about um, a fight that we continue to have for the remunicipalization of one line of the Seoul Metro, and it was made for the Congress of the International Transport Workers Federation in 2018, ITF, and so you will as part of the Our Public Transport campaign, and so you will, you will hear some things that kind of relate to ITF and the OPT campaign, but I'll explain more afterwards.
events. Our public transport program is also getting started. That program is exactly what we're doing in Korea, envisioning the type of public transport we want and doing that together with passengers. about this fight in the previous workshop, but this line is actually divided into, to, it was built in three phases. The first phase, the 30-year concession with a Korean developer, BTO, and then the second and third phases were done with public finance, but then contracted out to a Korean private company. So there are actually two different operators on the same line, and therefore we have, we organize two different groups, but into several <coughs> like locals in our union. And this is about the first phase. Uh, where the operator was a uh, French company. And at the end of the video, it says the contract was extended. That's actually incorrect. And we were just wondering why it was incorrect. But it's a 10-year contract. By the contract, there was supposed to be a re-evaluation of the terms of the contract halfway through. That was what was happening in, in October in 2018. And um, uh, because of the pressure, particularly what we were able to do by getting to, by lifting up the voices of passengers um, of, about the problems in the line because of the pressure on the Seoul city government at that time, they basically wanted to reduce the profits going to TransDev and RITP uh, Dev, and, um, and so they couldn't reach an agreement on the, on the new terms. It's the same contract, but they couldn't reach an agreement on, on the new terms for the second five years, and so the, the contract was canceled midway through. And, and we actually kicked out TransDev and, and RITP, but um, it means that our the line is now operated by that private developer that's Korean capital that has a 30-year concession, and so we haven't been able to get full remunicipalization of that part of the line. I understand that this session is about civil society and labor coalitions, so I wanted to just talk about that for a second. Um, as background, uh, in South Korea, unions have been the driving force in fighting privatization, not civil society, um, for the last 20 years. And so I think from a union perspective, we assume that it will be the workers that are the driving force behind uh, these struggles. And this is maybe a, you know, like a self-criticism or one of the weaknesses of the coalition building is that generally our coalitions are they're not exactly horizontal, and so they're really <laughs> unions organizing civil society to support our struggles as opposed to really collective efforts, and I think that's true. The, the coalition that came together first during the strike in 2017 and then kind of as an ad hoc group and then became an official coalition later on and worked on this campaign with us. It's not a broad base of civil society, to be honest. It's, um, it's made up of left political groups, probably the ones that would be, you know, I mean, we don't have the Labour Party you all have been talking about in the UK, or some of you have been talking about in the UK. <laughs> um, and, uh, but small, like, um, small political, left political parties and left political organizations, there aren't really community groups to work on with this, or writers groups, and so in order to bring in the voices of writers, we did those events like either the, the petition signature campaign, which was signature petition campaign, which was really important in the, in the stations, and then also what you saw in there was a talk concert in front of the Line 9 stations out on the street. So we had some experts come in and, and talk about the research we were doing about the problems in the line, but then passers-by, you could get um, like a soda and then also write something down about, like, I don't like how overcrowded Line 9 is and stick it on the board. And that was kind of one way to engage the community that isn't otherwise organized. Um, and so, uh, yeah, other things that we engage in together, but really with the union kind of at the center were um, press conferences, uh, research, which is done through our, my colleague is here from the um, 
Public Policy Institute for People, which is a research uh, institute that is affiliated to our union. Um, and so that was really important, as well as yeah, press bomb protests, uh, sit, sit in protests, and there's a pitch a tent in front of City Hall and kind of sleep there for a while, which is, may sound interesting to you, but is a very standard protest form in Korea, and that's something that you can do with left political groups, but probably not with community groups, right, to have them camping out there. Or, or, but those were, these are things that, that led to the cancellation of the contract. So we, we had a half win, and I think the reasons for that were general dissatisfaction with Line 9, particularly around the overcrowding. Um, happens, uh, it happened to be that the Seoul city government is somewhat sensitive to uh, issues around this. So the, Drive to privatize and PPP was from the previous Seoul mayor, and there's a more liberal government now in power. So, even though it took pushing them a lot to get them to actually uh, agree to the cancellation of the contract, um, and then of course really you know good organizing on the part of the unions. What's happened since this, however, is that um, so the, the 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 branch of our union, the local of our union, who is in who organizes these workers, their their local actually left the coalition after kicking out RTP Trans Dev because they said, now we have a new employer and it's actually, it's more expensive to kick that employer out <coughs> a 30 year contract until 2000, 2038. And so um, they want to work on building a relationship with the employer now, like a collective bargain, bargaining and, and to have a contract or a collective bargaining agreement. And um, because they're actually their conditions are improving now that they've gotten rid of one level of the of the, of the subcontracting chain, and so that's, I think that's a, you know, it's a question for us of how to work with them to return to the remunicipalization fight, but the other thing is that there are other private lines being built and operated in the Seoul Metro, and so one of the things we're just starting to think about is to expand the coalition to deal with the entire system, not just line nine, um, and to think about how we can start to try to ask for, uh, avenues for democratic participation in the planning of transport um, so that we can sort of stop these PPPs or outsourcing before it happens. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Are you actually going to sit there? Yeah. You've got a video as well, right? Yeah. Okay, we'll just we'll fire that up. Uh, our, our third speaker is uh, Tommy Albert Cobain from the Indonesian Legal Aid Institute Foundation. <coughs> and you want to play the video first? Yeah. 
menyalahgunakan gugatan warga negara kepada pemerintah, DPRD, Bank Jaya, dan dua perusahaan swasta. Mereka menuntut kontrak dibatalkan dan layanan air dikembalikan pada pemerintah daerah. Maret 2015, gugatan warga negara ini digabungkan oleh Pengadilan Negeri Jakarta Pusat. Akan tetapi, pada Januari 2016, pemerintah pusat, Malaysia, dan Aitra melakukan banding di Pengadilan Negeri DKI Jakarta dan Pengadilan Negeri Jakarta mengabulkan banding para tergugat ini. Warga mendapat kemenangan ini dengan melakukan kasasi ke Mahkamah Agung. Pada tahun 2017, Mahkamah Agung mengabulkan kasasi dan memerintahkan pengelolaan air minum harus dikembalikan ke PAM Jaya. Kemenangan warga negara ini sayangnya ditentang kembali oleh pemerintah pusat yaitu Kementerian Keuangan melalui peninjauan kembali di Mahkamah Agung. Sayangnya, Mahkamah Agung mengabulkan peninjauan kembali Kementerian Keuangan sehingga sampai saat ini layanan air perpipaan di Jakarta masih dikelola oleh Palija dan Aetra. Kondisi ini sebenarnya cukup ironis karena pada Februari 2015 Mahkamah Konstitusi Republik Indonesia membuat putusan yang membatasi peran swasta secara sangat ketat di layanan air perpipaan. Melihat sangat kompleksnya masalah dan kenyataan bahwa kontrak akan segera berakhir, maka sangat penting bagi pemerintah untuk mengambil keputusan. Jika kita tidak dapat segera mengakhiri kontrak, proses transisi adalah suatu keharusan untuk memulai segera. Tommy, you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, uh, after the Supreme Court announced their decision that they reject uh, our lawsuit, the governor still make... Sorry, Mike, Tommy, if you just need to face yeah. the audience a bit more, just get a side here. The governor still, in this statement before, I will write it, I will read it, that uh, he said that we take it over entirely, the whole four aspects which are raw water, distribution, processing, and service. So we still have opportunity, but uh, we don't know what will happen in the future. But because we, uh, we also know that uh, in, uh, in the other side, the private company is still working, lobbying, to get the another contract for the 25 years again. Well, I think it demonstrates, and Miriam will talk about this too, the legal process can be unbelievably difficult and a real barrier to remunicipalization. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about this fascinating case, Emmanuel Lubina and his colleague Vera Wigman have, have recently published something in the Open Access Journal, Water Alternatives, uh, a lengthy description of this rather painful legal process, as exciting as the groundswell of support is, the courts have just continued to block these things. Yeah, yeah. thank you for Emmanuel Lubina. He came to Jakarta to make strong our argumentation. So no one can beat his argumentation and our <laughs> argumentation. <laughs> we defeat in the Supreme Court just because a technical problem. But related to power of attorney later. Just just technical problem. That our argumentation. We cannot defeat yeah. our argumentation. Okay. Fascinating. All right, uh, the next uh, speaker we have on our list, uh, actually, sorry, Aaron uh, Brookmiller from Berlin is uh, unable to come uh, at the last minute, so uh, he will not be speaking. Uh, we'll move to Adrian Kane. Uh, do you have a video as well, Adrian? No. No, okay. Um, and uh, he's with SIPTU, the Public Administration, uh, the Union Public Administration and Community Division. Okay, um, thanks very much. I want to speak um, this afternoon about a campaign that three unions in Ireland started earlier this year. It's called More Power to You. And it's about trying to re-municipalise um, the domestic waste collection um, service in, in Ireland. So just um, a bit of background information in relation to the current status of the, the service. At the moment, almost one in four households have no domestic waste collection service. Um, we're unique in, in the EU in having side-by-side -side competition. So within a municipal um, 
authority space, there are, are multiple, or there can be multiple uh, providers, which causes all sorts of problems in cities where you have uh, a number of trucks on, on the on the same wrong blocking up um, um, streets and getting people up out of their beds at unreasonable hours of the day, as it were. We used to have a situation before all this was privatised where there was a waiver system where if you were from very uh, limited resources, you, you, you didn't have to pay for the service at all. All that has subsequently been uh, abolished. I'll talk a, in a minute about the profile of the, the, the workers in, in, the, in the private industry, but it's largely now a migrant workforce, um, tends to be agency, uh, and people tend to be on the minimum wage or less or, or a little above. Um, there is widespread um, illegal dumping, <coughs> both on a, on a small scale and also on, on an industrial scale. And most of the, the resources of the state are now put into uh, penalising people for illegal dumping. All the resources are after the fact, as it were, as opposed to, to planning and structuring it in a more progressive sort of way. So in short, uh, just to say, how did we get here? Probably the worst decision, I would say, after the dissolution of the monasteries in Ireland by King Henry VIII was the decision by um, the 1977 Tina Fáil government to abolish local rates for councils. So overnight, rates that there was no domestic or there was no local taxation system was was done away with. And as a result of that, that started to put in a chain of privatisation of services that had previously been conducted by the local authority, and that pace or, or, or that increased in pace from the 1980s on and probably the definitive piece of legislation comes then from 1996 the waste management act where essentially regulation ends all together and the only role that the state has is to provide a license so if you you roll up and say i'm a, a waste collector and i want a license you will get a license despite the fact that you may have multiple um appearances in the court for illegal dumping etc that can't be a reason as to why you wouldn't be provided with a license going forward um, Dublin City Council attempted to bring the waste back in in 2008 and it went to the High Court and it was found it didn't have the right to do it. And I'll go into, uh, you know, people have talked about the complexities around the law. There's a lot of complexities around the law, particularly when the state essentially abandoned the, the area, even insofar as any regulation. So the next key date after 2008 is this More Power to You campaign, which is three unions, that's Forza. SIP2 and Connect, and there's representatives from all the, 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 the unions in, in, in the room. That campaign was inspired by the, the TMI um, PSI conference that we had in uh, Geneva last year. Okay, By looking at videos like this and saying, well, if one of these people do it, we have to start, um, we have to start somewhere. And I think, uh, and I talked about the, the, this morning, I think you, you would you would characterise that, and Mary Murphy had talked about it as well, in terms of local government in Ireland. Local government in Ireland is more like local administration. And it stems from the colonial experience in terms of a very centralised state. When independence comes, there's a civil war, there's, so, so there's no reason as to why you start devolving power to, to local uh, councils, etc. And then you have a, a situation where the power switches from the paid administration or from the local councillors over to the paid, admi the, the, the paid administrators. We also have had huge privatisations over that period of time. And then the, auster the, the austerity period from 2008 particularly hit the, the local authority uh, sec sector very badly. In relation to the, the current state of play, there's around 6,000 workers in the industry. There's approximately 8% union density. And I'd say that's, in, in reality, that's decreasing. Um, as I say, there, there's probably around minimum wage or less it's mostly uh, migrant Eastern European labour, uh, a lot of agency, a lot of precarious employment. There are 80, there, there were 82 providers in 2012. There's a lot of consolidation. That's now down to 63 uh, last year. But of that, 20 operators control 90% uh, of the market. So we launched this campaign in March of, of this year. And we did it at that time because we, we were facing into a local elections. Okay, which took place in May of this year. And what we did through the, the, the unions working together, having our activists um, and engaging um, Mary Murphy to do a, a big and a significant uh, piece of research. We, we had regional meetings around the country and we got over a thousand candidates that were standing in local elections 
to support what we call a power pledge, uh, which was essentially people we were looking uh, to be, uh, to stand up for local government. Uh, and there were issues that we, we had five kind of bullet points in terms of democracy, looking for locally elected mayors, um, on waste, water, housing, and energy were the other areas as well. We've had a number of councils since have voted to re-municipalise their services, but because of the lack of power that councils have, they're quite meaningless um, motions. But at the same time, we're, we're, there are more and more people doing that, so it's bringing <coughs> attention to the issue. Uh, it's not transforming it in a radical way, but. Before we came out here, um, I think it was last week or was it this week, Peter? That's right. This week. We had a significant, we, we, we started to work with Dublin City Council again, and we have a very fragmented left, we call it a kind of balkanisation of the left, and that's no offence to anybody from the, from the Balkans. <laughs> um, but um, we have this very, very fragmented left um, that don't talk to each other. So we were able, through the, the trade union movement, acting as an umbrella, people feeling more at ease to work together in a progressive way. And what we managed to do is that we managed to, ourselves, essentially write the document, a two-page policy document. And we, we got a motion passed to get €75,000 put in place to conduct research in terms of Dublin City itself as to how it could be done. Okay? So that was a major break for us. Um, but the key to this is, it's from below, but it's also from above. Okay, so we're trying to generate that um, enthusiasm at council level, and between now and May, we hope to meet every single uh, council in the country, which is only 31. Um, of going through um, what has happened to waste, but other areas as well. Going back to what we had talked about in the broader um, objectives of the campaign. But we, 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 need to, we need to rewrite the, the, the legislation, and we've employed um, teams of lawyers to look at that as to what we need to do. And we're not quite there yet, but the next key date for us is, there's a general election in May, is to try and have that body of work done to essentially rewriting waste policy that would make it constitutionally um, legal for us to do it, and try to have that inserted into as many um, party political manifestos as possible. So that's where, where we find ourselves at the moment. And essentially we're trying to get back to um, a waste policy that works for the environment, um, the citizen uh, and the workers. So thanks very much. Wow, it's nice not to have to cut anybody off. This is great. Uh, okay, our second last speaker, uh, Alexander Pinto from Chile, uh, with the Movement for the Defense of Water, Land and the Environment. You're going to show a quick video first? No, no sorry. No. I don't have a video. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice videos. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Uh, sorry about, for my English. I will try to do my best. Um, as it was said, I'm from Modatima. That is the movement of defense of water, <coughs> land, and environment from Chile. And uh, it's important to say that we are a social movement. Okay. Uh, we are not an NGO, a political party, or a social movement, uh, with the difference that, that this has. Uh, you can, we have Twitter, Facebook, and all that uh, website, so you can follow us. <laughs> so, um, okay, let me start. The, the, it's the short, it's short time, but I, I, I need to, to explain a little bit about the situation in Chile. So you understand a little bit how uh, we emerge as a movement, okay? I don't know if you can see from the back, but in this photo you can see an animal that is uh, dead, you know? Uh, but the particular thing is this, uh, used to be a river, okay? This is the, the Petorca region, this river is called La Ligua, and uh, while you can see that it's an animal that is dead, uh, and there is no superficial water in the river. You can see in the back, I don't know if you can see it, but in the back you see the hills, but the hills are full of plantations, avocado plantations, yeah, for the exportation, mainly Europe. Okay? So uh, the thing is that in this region is that we as Modatima started because 
all of this, this, this possession situation that happens in Chile, that the animals are dying, it's not only human, that is important for us in Latin America, it's not only the, the, the consequences that this has on humans, it's also the consequences in life in general, human and not human life. So this system that brings death, is, the problem in Chile is that it's totally legal. We have a system that has privatized not only the, the water supply companies, but also the water rights, the use, the uses of the river, of the lakes, it's also, it's also privatized in Chile, okay? So I, I wanted to show the, the, this picture because it's important for us to know, to explain where we, come, uh, where we are from. Uh, the other, but I'm, not, I'm going to talk more about the, the situation, about um, the one aspect that we are struggling as Modatima, that it's in, in the urban areas and the water supply system. Because we are also struggling against extractivism, but now I'm going to speak more about the, the water supply system in Chile. Just for you to know, uh, in Chile, uh, in, the, in the cities, the 96% of the water supply companies are in, in private hands. 96%. And 90% uh, of these private companies are controlled by three uh, transnationals. Okay? Uh, Akbar, Akbar in alliance with Suez, Ontario Teachers Pensions Plan, and Marubeni, that it's a Japanese group. Uh, we, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to explain and uh, extend myself, but the thing is that we have the same, comp uh, the same problems with privatization, the problems uh, with corruption, the problems with the high prices of water, the problem with the lack of transparency, the lack of social view for, uh, for the water management. Uh, so in that context is that, is that we for a while as Modatima are denouncing all what is happening among the water privatization in Chile. Okay? Mainly uh, from the year 2012, where we this denounce about the, uh, the privatization in the urban areas. Uh, the thing is that this happened. Okay, I don't know if you can see the picture, but uh, the students in Chile, it starts with this uh, jumping the, in the metro because of, uh, as a way to protest for the high prices, okay? And this generates, uh, some people call that it's a social explosion, we say that it's a people rebellion because uh, all the, the anger that was accumulated about the consequences of the neoliberal system explode, but it's, just, uh, but it's uh, because of this rebellion of the people, you know? So the thing is that uh, we are in this context, and the social explosion of October of 2019, and, and one thing is that, that I want to, to say, it's, and maybe I, I want to explain it more in the final panel, but uh, the importance to understand that crisis are always problematic, but the crisis are is also opportunities. Opportunities to some ideas, to move forward some ideas, right? So the thing is that we were struggling against the water privatization, but we have this explosion, and it starts to move some things about what the demands of the people. And one of the particular situation is what happened in a, in a city that's called Osorno, that it's a city of 1,000, um, 180,000 uh, 180, people. Okay. Right. Uh, sorry. Uh, so what happened in Osorno this year? The the water company that it's Esal, controlled by by Aguas de Barcelona and Suez, throw into the, the, the water supply system a thousand and hundred liters of oil of petroleum in the in the in the water supply system that lives on the people for more than 10 days without water, you know? It was a social crisis, it was very dramatic, okay? But the thing is that the, the, this was the opportunity to all the people to go to the streets and demand that the, that the company, the, the private company, must go away, you know? So it's, this starts with a lot of force. So the thing is that we have this, that was before this explosion, you know? But the thing is that with this social rebellion in Chile, these uh, demands, like the demand in Osorno, it starts to bring and win some more force, you know? 
So uh, we start to build, also as Modatima, uh, we build some communication info. Uh, this is a sub, this is the companies to try to be what are the connections between the political actors and the companies to try to denounce. And the other thing is that we by the Blue Planet project in Canada. And the thing is that showing how, how what are the real impacts of a, about water privatization in Chile. So the thing is that in this city of Sorno, we uh, called to a big demonstration last week. You know, after all this social explosion, we go to this uh, demonstration to uh, you can say come to jail to jail to scream to, to shout. Uh, Goodbye, Esal. You know, go away. So that's the call that we made to the to the mobilization. And the thing is that we were, was very massive. Uh, a lot of people go to the streets and demand all the, this mobilization. And the thing is that the the impact that this have is that this week, <coughs> this week, the mayor that is not a progressive mayor of this city of Osorno and the council of the local government announced that they're going to make a public consultation to ask, ask to the people if they are going, if they want the, to this company SL keep with the water supply concession or no. Okay? For, maybe for you it's a, a very normal thing. For us this is historical because it's the first time that in Chile uh, it's made a public consultation after the dictatorship about a water privatization uh, country. You know? <laughs> and the truth is that this wouldn't happen uh, uh, without all this social mobilization that we are experiencing in Chile. And this, uh, it wasn't by the mayor, you know, it was for all these people that are in the streets. Yeah. So, the thing is that we're with a lot of hope in this moment. We are also concerned because of the repression. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit in the final panel about that. But we are with a lot of hope right now because if we can achieve to end the concession of this company, that it's a decision that the final decision is from the president of the republic of the nation. Uh, but uh, if we can end this concession, we can open up uh, the door. To more process of deprivatization in the country. So for us, it's very important. And uh, how much? One minute. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, one thing about the um, the workers and citizens alliance. I say that we are a social movement that is struggle for water, land, and environment. But with this uh, with this um, rebellion that was spontaneous, wasn't organized. You know, uh, the president tried to. Uh, blame the, that was a fault for Cuba, Venezuela, <laughs> to okay. they don't have too much for that. But the thing is that we uh, need to get more together, so we create a platform that is called so Social Unity, Unidad Social, that we start to get, get uh, gather with people with, that we, uh, we don't used to, to, to gather, like the unions, like with the feminist groups, that we like uh, try to do some things, but not, never to build a, a, plat a common platform. So that is happening in the last time. It's very difficult, but the thing is that this, this, uh, this idea, this, um, what, this effort, yeah, it has never been, uh, happened in that way after the dictatorship. And I think that we have a challenge, because we, don't, we know that we don't want privatization, but the thing is, what we what we want after privatization, I think, is that is a, because uh, for us it's very controversial. For example, the 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 title of this session that it's around uh, remunicipalization. We, uh, as, as Modatima and others, and other movements in Latin America, like the, that participate in La Red Vida and the platform of public and community partnerships, we don't speak about remunicipalization. Yeah, it's a, a, it's a long discussion. But the thing is that we prefer to say that we want a social reappropriation of the public, mm -hmm. a social reappropriation of the commons, you know? That it's beyond the discussion about the state and it's beyond the discussion about the, own, the public ownership. So I think that we have a challenge. We need to invent something new. Okay. So Thank you.
quick man. My wife is a part owner of the private water company. <laughs> Let me explain. This is how insidious this thing is. She's a public school teacher in Ontario. The Ontario Teachers Pension Fund is the majority owner of Chile's privatized water system, a union that is opposed to privatization. Their pension fund was effectively privatized, and now they have no control over how that union, uh, that pension fund invests. And actually, the vice chancellor of my university was the former head of that pension fund. So, what is public? Who has control over these resources? It's an incredibly complicated matter. So. Uh, yeah, I, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, our uh, last but not least, uh, we're going to talk about complexity. Oh my goodness, Barcelona. Uh, Miriam Planis, uh, Engineers Without Borders, and she's going to, I think, talk about the struggle in Barcelona. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> you got three days? Uh, I think I'll put it in the end. I'll try to save one minute because it's a very short video. And it's complicated to talk about Chile. Thank you for the update and the hope that comes from there. Um, maybe I try to bring a little bit of hope, but maybe I won't be able to make it. Uh, I have to start with Catalan context, I think, before before talking about Barcelona, if we are thinking about um, hope. And uh, I am also a spokesperson for Iguas Vida, which is a, pla a platform that brings together social environmental movements in Catalonia and also uh, um, environmental NGOs and solidarity NGOs, as is the case of uh, Engineers Without Borders. And we've been working about 10 years for water municipalization in, in Catalonia. We started with doing some maps, uh, doing some transparency, putting the data uh, available for the, for the citizens. And this was in 2014. And six years later, five years later, we can, I think we can say it has its effects. And uh, the municipalizations in Catalonia began in 2010 with one municipality and now in, 2000, in 2019 we have 27 cities that have remunicipalized. One of them is Terrassa, which is the fourth biggest one in, in Catalonia. And it's, there was not only a, a remunicipalization, but in Terrassa there was, or they are trying to experiment on this social reappropriation of the commons, which I think is a challenge. And we need to keep continuing exploring and inventing because we don't have that solved. Um, I wanted to start with the context in Catalonia because that's a little bit more that gives us a little bit more hope because I think it's it's a it's a victory that we have 27 municipalizations and we have more coming in between 2015 and 2025 there are 100 contra contracts that expire of 100 municipalities so there is a window of opportunity for little little and, and big cities to recover and reappropriate water. And that is a challenge we don't have to forget. Because these past two years we've been so, so, so uh, centered in, in Barcelona 5 that maybe we have not celebrated in sometimes big enough all these little and not so little victories that we've had during the, the way. And going back to Barcelona, because uh, I don't want to miss my time, in 2010, it was discovered that there was no contract in Barcelona, <coughs> Barcelona, and 22 more cities around the Barcelona <coughs> metropolitan area. Uh, in 2012, to regulate this, this irregular situation, there was a mixed company created uh, between Akbar and the, the public administration and a bank, La Caixa. Um, I was with a made a big uh, complaint against it. We bring it to court, but the court didn't listen to us. But the other big companies, brought also the case to court and in 2016 the mixed company was cancelled because of the other private companies complaints and demands and that gave us a lot of hope and we started we we keep up with our campaign in barcelona but in 2017 by the end of 2017 we decided to start a, a referendum uh, to, to ask for a referendum in barcelona and we gathered together 26,000 signatures People in Barcelona City was so involved. There was a lot of social support, and on the other side, Agua Suez started a really huge campaign 
uh, we believe out of the fear, because of the fear, and they started doing advertisement every day in the public television, private television, in the buses, the stations, everywhere. You could see every day something from, from Akbar. They also started with lots of legal challenges of demands and appeals against the, the referendum in Barcelona, even though it was not binding. It was a non-binding referendum, but they were so afraid they made about 30 different appeals and demands from different umbrellas, lobbies, um, some of them themselves and other friends of them. Uh, they also used historical people from the social movements from Barcelona to make a publication that they didn't know it was for Akbar. But they, they appeared and then some of them denunciated that. And the final surprise for us was that we discovered during the, that during the gathering of signatures, we had private detectives infiltrated in our meetings. And we managed to, to, to make it public and yeah. Um, finally, we gathered the signatures, we presented to the Barcelona City Council and the referendum was approved in October 2018, but it has been blocked after that in the, in the tribunals, in the, uh, in the court. So for now we cannot do the referendum, we have to wait for some uh, juridical appeals to be solved. We believe maybe in 2021 we could have a, a referendum. But meanwhile, we were waiting for the Supreme Court decision because when the mixed company was cancelled in 2016, the <coughs> company appealed to the Supreme Court of Spain. So we, we had to wait until the Supreme Court of Spain decided, as in Jakarta. And it's been three long years where the fight, we keep up with the fight in, in Barcelona. After the referendum was blocked, we learned a manifesto which was called Commitment for Public Water in Barcelona, which you can enter in our website, iwabcn.org, and you can sign. And we have 2,060 collectives from the metropolitan area of Barcelona who have already signed. Um, and we were really hopeful with the court decision, the Supreme Court decision, but last week it finally came and it was... Uh, it was totally unexpected, but they uh, changed completely the, the Supreme the Supreme Court Catalonia of Spain the Supreme Court of Catalonia decision. So they went to the other side, and they said the mixed company was legal, based in a permit that Agbar has from 1953, a permit to take water from the Llobregat River from the river. Uh, yeah, it's a permit from the Franco Times, but the decision of the Supreme Court of Spain says so, so that's what it uh, is right now. The legal, uh, the, the mixed company legality has been secured, um, so the business for La Caixa, for Akbar, and for Suez has been secured too, and um, nevertheless, our campaign continues. I will show you now the video so we can have something uh, better. And we believe that um, these long-term fights, yeah, uh, which is important, the, the Supreme Court decision was a highway for the municipalization. So it was, and, and it was a big, big <coughs> for Akbar. But uh, this is, somehow we believe this is not it's not um, solid. Like the people is eighty percent of people in Barcelona are for public uh, public water management. No, <coughs> so we, when the sentence came, there was also a, a public survey made to the citizenship, and it said eighty percent of, of people in Barcelona and the metropolitan area want public water management. So these kind of arguments, uh, the the judges can can block it. But somehow, I think we'll manage to do it. Maybe we need to go city by city, and it will take uh, until 2047 that they have the contract. But we'll keep the fight, and we have to fight more than, than everyone. And in this way, <coughs> we live citizen alliance, alliances with other cities, alliances with uh, water operators, which are already public, alliances with the workers who are uh, for it are essential.
and we need to give up doing the, the work we want to do because I think we work alone. Well. 26. thing and its whole colonial history so it's an alternative uh, to that uh, meeting up in front of the mosque here uh, we need to leave here at 325 that gives us uh, 12 minutes to decide and have a conversation uh, I'll just say quickly what always strikes me and I've been working on this for 10 years and every time I see presentations like this after 30 years of understanding the problems of privatization it's pretty straightforward it's the same thing in the same places in different places different sectors, you know, it, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. You know what the problems are, it's pretty easy to understand. But when you try and re-municipalize and change back, it's so different in every place. The legal structure, the kind of alliances on the ground, what people want out of a reconstituted public provider. So I think there's a real challenge for us as activists and academics to try and understand context and difference while also seeing that there's there's something that binds us together here so what is it that binds us together what is it that makes it different what's you know happening in barcelona versus in chile and and how can we learn lessons from each other without imposing a kind of universal sense of what we want out of this and i think that's a real you know uh ethical and, and logistical and, and theoretical challenge for all of us so thank you very much for uh for giving us those deep insights so maybe we'll just take uh, a handful of very quick uh, comments slash questions, uh, take three or four, and then one last round from the panel, and then we'll, we'll head off. So I saw Marion had a hand. Anyone else got uh, two? All right, let's take those two quick. Yeah, thank you very much for the panelists. Uh, very good presentation and great combination of different views. Thank you very much for the um, it's, it's a question for all the panelists. I mean, one thing that I, I noticed also working on the municipalization and reclaiming um, well, public services for a long time is that remunicipalization and municipalization cost money, uh, mm -hmm. public money. And I've seen states like Salangor in a way that took the route of not of legal but actually buying, back, buying out the private sector, the private companies, which is very costly. Um, it, you know, it's hundreds and hundreds of million dollars. And I was, uh, and euros actually, and I was wondering whether in the case of Barcelona and Jakarta, is that a strategy that, that you're, you're taking a look at? Because I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this more in richer countries, uh, <coughs> in states, not so much in poorer, uh, poorer municipalities. Municipality. Is that a strategy that you're taking a look at in terms of the possibility of just the, the city government or the, you know, the, the regional government of Jakarta to buy out the, the public? while you're waiting for the legal battle to pan out and they vote? Yeah, second question. More or less a comment. Uh, what's, what struck me was um, it's more or less the same companies. Uh, we see uh, the, the name Suez, uh, Veolia. Uh, <laughs> so I was saying I hope I'm not too political incorrect, but um, I think you, uh, the people from outside Europe, uh, most of you, uh, hey, uh, your country is freed from colonization, eh? and it looks 
bit to me that it's back in another form by big companies from Europe and the rest of the Western world. Um, so uh, is it is it only in the water sector, uh, or do you see uh, that also in other places in your in your uh, public services in your countries? Great. And so there's one uh, third uh, question comment here. Very quickly, uh, a question for my friend from Chile. Uh, I know it's pretty uh, new the the process, but I wonder if the constitutional process will you, uh, touch in the privatization and the water and what the demands from the from the people. Okay. Maybe is there any one last pressing question or comment? No. Okay. Why don't we do uh, one last round of, of comments? You can respond to this questions or just anything else you want to say. And uh, why don't we start with Tony? Yeah. Jakarta province had enough money to buy the company, boat company. Uh, legal, the lawsuit also impact the price of the company. It become decreased, decreased, decreased year over year. So the Jakarta province uh, had enough money because in 2008 there is around 12 mil, what? Up from million? Billion. 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 Up again? Billion. Sorry. Billion. 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 Left from the budget from 2018. And the price of the boat company is around only 5 trillion rupiah. So there is enough money. And for the uh, expand the coverage of service also, as I think we the province can search the budget from the other resource and uh, it will it not suddenly but progressively to expand the coverage of service. The second about stress and things, uh, they already sell the company to the Indonesia owner. Uh, the name is Salim Group. This person also the owner of uh, water company in Manila. <laughs> so the, no, no preference in England again in Jakarta. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. You you wanna... Yeah. Just uh, on the two questions. One in, in terms of looking at our, our own particular campaign, it's a kind of staging post. Okay. The first thing that we have to do is get rid of side by side competition. Okay. That that's the that's the first. Um, stop on, on the road to if we get to re-municipalisation with the intention that if you get rid of side-by-side -side competition you're back to a tendering process mm -hmm. and then realistically it'll be Dublin that we would be focusing on in terms of um, it was one of the last places to privatise because you, you get into the difficulty of what corporate knowledge is left within uh, a municipal uh, authority in terms of being able to, to do this, okay? And also, you, you're working always against the zeitgeist of the last 40 years of, of getting rid, rid of things. And I think trying to, trying to turn that around, it, you do need to have moments in, in terms of whether you call them revolutionary moments or what's happened in Chile or whatever, of the potential of every moment that may have some sense of revolution. But even if you were to look at the situation in, in Norway, now, I'm not sure if there's anybody from Norway in the, in the audience, but yeah. with regard to yeah, the Ingrid, uh, mm -hmm. there. But, but I wonder myself in terms of that company hasn't gone bust in Oslo. That was the opportunity, it, and, and it's a key moment that allows the, 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 the conversation to change. So I think we have to be, sometimes you can get lucky with this, okay? And, and, but I think we have to be conscious of the revolutionary power of any particular uh, moment or as my comrade from Chile had said, you know, that, that sense of, of revolution that, that is possible. Yeah, it's all the same company. So we're sitting here and talking to, and we were looking at um, Seoul uh, and Transdev control the um, trans system in, in, in Dublin. And it is a, a, a neo colonization of, of the world through corporate power. And it, it, it's very European companies. Um, Yeah, so um, the, the French 
multinationals are the are the biggest. I mean, there are other ones right from the UK and Canada and everything, but uh, the Transdev and then RUTP Dev, which is this private subsidiary of the very good public operator of the Paris Metro and Paris uh, Transit System, are are really big in public transport. But so now in Korea, we've kicked them out. They were the only transnational in Korea, and all of the other private operators are Korean capital. And if I look at Thailand, also, um, in long distance rail, there's transnationals coming in, and then also in rolling stock, there's transnationals like um, uh, Siemens, um, Bombardia, but, uh, but, but their operators are, are, are Thai capital. And it's, I think it's actually more difficult to campaign against national capital. Mm -hmm. So I didn't like that our affiliate would not call trans RATP Transdev, RATP Transdev. They, they called it the French operator. <coughs> I didn't like that because it's like nationalist. You know, it was like something like we don't like we don't like French capital, but somehow Korean capital is okay. You know, but <laughs> but it was a lot easier to talk about uh, Korean uh, French capital. And so now we have to talk about something different. And mm -hmm. and um, I think the same is true, for example, in Thailand, which has this massive expansion of these little private operators also. Um, so uh, one thing, and then I guess uh, it would cost about a billion euros to buy out the rest of that thirty-year concession, is what I calculated. I may have it wrong, but so it's. It might be possible, but I don't know that there's a, a political will to spend that much money, especially when the, the, the public metro is run on deficit. So that's a that's another issue. And I just wanted to end by asking the two uh, last speakers to talk about what you mean by social reappropriation of mm -hmm. public services and how that's different. My colleague and I were just before the session talking about how we need to try to reframe in Korea. We also don't talk so much about re-municipalization. We sort of talk about read public operation or publicness, but I don't know that those are good uh, framings for the public, actually. And so I'd, maybe you could give us an insight into what you mean, how it's different. Okay. <laughs> 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 you have two minutes. <laughs> experience of neoliberalism so very uh, almost uh, <coughs> all the public service are, have a, are private and have a, a strong participation of multi, uh, transnationals uh, energy uh, when you see the food <coughs> system when you see transport and even the universities it's very uh, a, a very strong participation of transnational but I think that uh, there are two sectors that are very strategic when we have a, 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 a major participation of a major transnationals, that one is it's water that I already said, and the other the other is energy, and and, and and it makes sense, you know, because water and energy are very strategic in, in any geopolitical struggle, right? Uh, so that's about the first. The second one about the constitution. Ooh, uh, for us, a new constitution, it's like the, the common horizon between the different movements that we are in the, in the battle and the struggle and right now in Chile. Uh, because we, the, the constitution that we have was made by Pinochet, the dictatorship in the 80s. So it guarantees a lot of these uh, principles of the neoliberalism are established in the constitution. For example, uh, the recognition of water as a uh, private uh, private uh, ownership of water, of the water rights, of what I was showing about the rivers and all that, it's in the constitution of Chile, you know? So the thing is that, yeah, we need to change the constitution. That's a, a one thing that we know that we need to change it, and it's, uh, we are pushing to make a, how do you say, uh, um, Asamblea Constituyente, Constitu uh, as Constitutional Asamblea. <laughs> Yeah, constitutional Assembly. Yeah. So, uh, but the thing is that we also win uh, some of these movements, Modatima, uh, uh, for instance. We know that a new, a new, a new legislation uh, doesn't ensure that we can make a different, a different system, a different way of organizing, organizing life. Because, but it helps. We know that it, we know that helps. 
because we know that in the in the bottom and uh, deep in, uh, what is really important it's not only have new uh, good legislation if you Latin America see countries like Brazil for example Brazil has a very beautiful constitution you know but uh, in, the, in fact a lot of the things that are, or the rights are established in the constitution are not uh, Accomplish and not make an effective, you know. So I think we know that we make we need to make a new a new a new economy, you know, a new social way, a, a, a new way to produce and reproduce uh, life, you know. That's the I think that's the most this, the most difficult, but it's the most challenging uh, strategy that we have, and uh, the reappropriation. Okay, uh, the, why? Uh, the thing is that, uh, for example, in, in Latin America, we have a very important, not not only historical ancestral, but also, uh, ah, okay, uh, no, uh, communities, uh, <laughs> uh, recognized communities, uh, and we we need to we have a problem also with the discussion about uh, ownership. Uh, um, we can talk about it. Okay. So about the cost, I, I will start with the, the median question. Um, the, 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 the cancellation of the mixed company was was a big issue because it it would have been an opportunity to recover the company to recover the water without paying almost anything. That was the provisions. That was not the provisions of the private company who said we had to pay 1,500 million euros, but we don't believe that. But without this, uh, with, with the Supreme Court decision we have, uh, we, we, we think we are in a Berlin scenario where, where we would probably have to pay a lot of millions to recover the company. How many? We don't have the number. but. What we know is they are earning, they are supposed to earn 1,000 million euros in 35 years. Uh, but they are earning 60% more than it was supposed. So the, benefit, the profits are 60% above from 2012 to 2015, 60% above for the, from the economical plan that they made. So they are stealing money right now. And they also made an, this is difficult to explain, an, an assessment of the, una valoración de activos, an assessment for their, um, their uh, network, their assets, the yeah, assessment for the assets, uh, which was irregular. They overrated the privates, their, their own ones, uh, about four times, and then they infravalorated the public one uh, ten times. So this needs to be reviewed. And independent, Independently from the Supreme Court decision, this needs to be reviewed, and we need to look at that because we have 50 percent percentage from the private, uh, from the public administration, and 85 from the private. So we need to look at that more um, quietly. And uh, and then we also have the political will. It's not a matter of not only of money, but the political will. Because if we would have the political will, which we don't have, because the socialists are a problem. Um, then we could demonstrate tomorrow, and we would make an economical plan, I'm sure of that. But the, the main thing is how to do the political will of, of the socialists, where what it was an issue in Paris and in other places, I know for, uh, about that, so we need to think also on that. And the social preoccupation, I think we need to talk about the Russia case, because it's very interesting. But I think it, it, it's a matter of taking back responsibility from the citizens, uh, in urban areas, mainly uh, for the public services we have, because we have already, we have forgotten totally. You know, it's something that works because the private makes it work, and we need to to go back to, to take responsibility and taking decisions about that. How to do it? We can talk about that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you.